today. I want to talk to you about how this turned into this. Not really in how they looked. I just assumed that the past was all in black and white, but more so how sound went from here to here. How does sounds it guess is so dang cool? Well, back in the times of no alcohol and lots of illegal alcohol, a new pastime was on the rise. And that pastime, can you guess it? Going to the movies. Theaters were a place that at the time you could go and escape a hot summer day and socialize with your peers or maybe meet out with a date one night, maybe get some smooches in the back. Movie theaters, also known as theaters, were just that back in the day. They were just theaters. Plays, musicals, orchestras, things like that would all happen in the same space. And since movie theaters were just theaters, and theaters had plays, and plays had sound, that meant movies could too. Since film had access to sound in the way that it did, this meant that they not only were able to blast your eyes with stimulation, but also your ear holes. Now, by today's standards, sure, that isn't very crazy at all. Every movie in its sequel, prequel, and pre-squequel has sound and music in it. So why should I care about what old dead people listen to? Uh, you're stupid, here's why you should care. Sound is fundamental to film, and I think that's a given, but understanding why sound is so fundamental to film I think is a lot more difficult. So, to deal with this, I've divided sound in twain. These categories are sound effects and sound design in general, and music. So we're gonna start with this one. Sound effects, in my own humble description, are all additional noises that uh, are used to add effect and or punch. The sound effects are anything from like the birds chirping on a warm summer morning to, well, like this. And then show the Tom Hanks clip from Saving Private Ryan. Its whole point is to immerse you in whatever world it's trying to create. But film was not the first place that use of sound effects was seen. The first place was from another arts clan, theater. Theater sound effects, though, were procured in a very different way from how we would procure sound effects today, where we would go to our little laptops or computers and look up what sound effect we wanted and download it from the internet. Back in the day, they would just have a dude standing behind the curtain and bang on stuff during the play for different sounds that they needed. Anyway, this form of creating sound effects would stick around for like 2,000 years because despite it being just a dude hitting stuff behind the curtain, like, it sounded pretty good. This is all to say that when movies came to theaters, it was a no-brainer that they were going to use sound effects alongside films. They even appeared in The Great Train Robbery, which is attributed with being the first narrative film ever created. Since sound was still being played live in the theaters, Every show and showing thereafter had a different soundtrack or slightly varying soundtracks and also slightly varying sound effects. So you could have a very different experience. Sound effects at the time though were created by dropping things and like shaking this big thing and also using this. Which is crazy looking. Anyway, that meant that variety was pretty low and that options for the available sound effects were pretty limited, even more so limited depending on what theater you went to. Sound effects did what Zam and Kapow did for comic books, and that was just make it more entertaining. Sound effects were able to add more effect and power and meaning and understanding to movies. They were able to expand on the world and on the plots of these films uh, beyond what they were already able to, even in limited ways. Okay, so that's most of what we need to know about sound design and sound effects in general. Uh, but now we can move on to category two, music. Music has been such a fundamental human expression for as long as like history has been around. 
Since music already felt like a natural part of film, it was seamlessly integrated into narrative film from the very beginning, starting back again with The Great Train Robbery. Music is there to fully envelop the audience in a blanket of emotion and world building. Sometimes this can be a warm and nice blanket, that's been taken straight out of the dryer and given to you, and so you wrap yourself in it and now you're all warm and cuddly. On the other hand, that same movie that made you feel warm and nice and good with that nice music can also make you feel like doo-doo dog trash later on in that same very movie. I mean, take that one scene from Up. See a nice warm blanket as you curl up on the couch. And then... And now I'm cold and I feel really bad and I'll cry a little bit. Thanks for music. But really, music has so much control and influence over the tone and emotion of a film. An example I would like to bring up is Castaway. Castaway purposely forgoes music until the end during the scene where Tom Hanks, originally named Tommy Hanklin, yells Wilson at a blood-covered volleyball floating away at the horizon. And yet, you still, for some reason, want to cry a little bit. But since we're all adults here, let's talk about why it makes us want to cry a little bit. This scene would not hold nearly the same emotional value without the mo without the music. This scene would not hold nearly the same emotional weight were it not for the music that accompanied it. I mean Mike, come on. You feel actual sympathy for a guy who lost a volleyball with a blood face on it. But the reason that you're able to feel this way is because the music is able to tell you the exact fear, despair, and worry that Tommy's character is feeling by this ball floating away from him. The only thing to keep him company during his time of isolation on that island, as well as the only friend that he has, is literally drifting away in front of him. His life is literally being taken away by the ocean. That is the sort of emotion that music is able to display. But music couldn't really do that without the hundreds of hours of digital audio mixing and mastering, let alone a computer, it wasn't even invented yet. But to do that, we had to get all the smart people to stop doing whatever they were doing so that they could make our movies sound better and more cool. Back in 1877, a man by the name of Thomas Edison, Tommy Eddy to his friends, created the phonograph. The phonograph was the first device with the ability to both record and play back audio. The only issue is that it kind of sucked. So this dude, Alexander Graham Bell, said, uh, I can do that, but better. And so what he did was he made all of those things, but better. People were pretty happy with that, but then in 1894, this dude, Emil Berliner, said, Only nerds and dweebs like cylinders. I'm a disc man. And made the flat disc record that we all know today. This allowed for the creation of some of the first commercial sound synchronization systems in the 1920s, like the sound on disc system and the sound on film system. The sound on disc system was just the turntable part of either a phonograph or a gramophone attached to a modified projector that just allowed for the synchronization of both the film and the audio. This one wasn't very good. It saw some success in its future offspring with Things like the Vitaphone, which was made and used by Warner Brothers, and the Warner Sister Dot. But the general issue with sound on disc systems was that they'd had trouble staying on sync, meaning that they had trouble doing their one job. It just meant that they died out pretty quickly. Sound on disc systems, though, are still very important due to how they pioneered the sound on film industry and helped push innovation within it. 
So now the industry needed a highly editable form of sound synchronization that discs just couldn't provide. What materials do we have now that is easily editable? <gasps> this is where sound on film systems and synchronization comes in. Sound on film systems originated when this dude named Lead the Forest walked into a movie theater one day and then got too tired of reading the words and said, Man, this sucks. I hate this. This is dumb. No one wants to be here. This place sucks. It mega stinks. No one likes it here. And then he left. Not really, I think. It would be kind of funny, though. DeForest was already well known in the Science Inventor Guy community for inventing the Audion tube, which is just a weird looking light bulb thing that was used by AT&T to amplify telephone signals back in the day. Is really any of this information important to us at all? No, not really at all, no. At least not in our story. This weird little light bulb thing is incredibly important in the wider scheme of the world. But in our context, what this means is that he got put on the map so that when he would later go on and try to create a sound on film system, people were willing to help him. On March 12th, 1923, DeForest would present his sound on film system phonofilm to the press for the very first time. His system, along with all sound on film systems, work by recording a photographic audio format along the side of film. Though, when I say his system, I mean that he was more so of an idea man and that he relied pretty much completely on other people to build a system that he had failed to build himself. Phonofilm actually utilized a lot of the inventions of another American inventor named Theodore Case, who worked with DeForest. DeForest and Case would later have a falling out when DeForest refused to credit Case for work he had done, which, after pouring over the numbers, doing the algebra and calculus in my head, carrying the one, and placing my decimals, was pretty much all of it. Case had done all of the work. Case and DeForest would stop working together after this falling out, but Case would continue to work towards perfecting the sound on film system. Case's patents would actually later be bought by William Fox, founder of the Fox Film Corporation, aka what would later become 20th Century Fox, aka the makers of these very successful movies. And Case himself would actually go on to work for Fox at the newly established Fox Case Corporation, where he would work on improvements to sound tech. This would be the beginning of the sound film era. Sound on film systems became the industry standard by 1931, leaving behind the days of the sound on disc system, which may be gone, but never forgotten. Sound film became incredibly popular with studios like Warner Brothers and Warner Sister Dot increasing from a mere 2 million to 14 million in just two years. This waterfall of money was in large part thanks to the meteoric rise of musicals, which were able to take full advantage of the new sound systems. The rest of narrative film, on the other hand, still had a little bit of growing up to do. So short, he's all the way down here, he needs to get up to here. At the beginning of sound on film technology, things were still very clunky. Dialogue droned on intended to either mean nothing or too much. Sound would continue to develop as time went on, not only in places like the US, but also in other countries like Germany, Italy, France, the UK, Russia, and many more countries around the world. People started to mess with sound and experiment with it because they wanted to see how it would affect people's emotions. Sound is able to truly immerse you into a world and give you the experience that the film's creator was trying to share with you. Sound allowed for a deeper connection between film, filmmaker, and audience. Anyway, that's been my time. Uh, go watch a movie or something sometime. Uh, I probably won't because I have like a thousand things I need to do before the weekend, but enjoy getting lost in a world of sound. Thank you.